Hello, everyone. My name is Megan Glenn. I am the National Assistant Director of Programs at the American Liver Foundation, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, made possible by the generous support of Alberio. The American Liver Foundation is the nation's largest nonprofit serving people with liver disease. We provide a voice for patients with liver disease and their families through education, support, research, and advocacy. I would like to thank Dr. Udeme Ekong, who will be sharing her expertise on today's webinar, and Nicole Radigan, who will be sharing her journey as a PFIC patient caregiver and advocate for her daughter, Jamie. Let me just start with a few housekeeping items. On the upper right-hand part of your screen, you should see a dialog box. If you don't see it, there's an orange arrow you can use to expand the window. Um, from here, you can ask questions. You can ask questions at any time, and we'll be answering them in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the webinar. Uh, we will get to as many questions as possible, and we welcome your participation, so please do send questions in. I would now like to talk, introduce Dr. Udeme Ekong. Dr. E Ekong is the Medical Director of the Pediatric Liver Transplant Program and the Pediatric Hepatology Program at Yale Medicine, and is, a board, certifi is board certified in general pediatrics, pediatric gastroenterology, and pediatric transplant hepatology. She is also an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Ekong specializes in treating conditions including acute liver failure, autoimmune liver disease, metabolic liver disease, genetic coleostasis, and biliary atresia. Dr. Ekong, I will give you the floor. Thank you very much, Megan. Um, I'd like to thank the um, organizers of um, this meeting, the American Liver Foundation, for the um, invitation to um, speak today on PFIC. These are some of the objectives I have for um, our talk today. Now, um, I'm going to be talking about PFIC or progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis. And I think what I'd like to do is start off with what we mean by when we say a child has cholestatic liver disease. In fact, what are bile acids? What are the consequences of um, impaired excretion of these bile acids? And why are bile acids retained in some of the um, PFIC subtypes? So bile acids are actually steroid acids that are made or synthesized by the liver and they're excreted into the bile. And so the bile is composed of cholesterol, phospholipids and bile acids. We talk about a bile acid pool made up of primary or secondary bile acids. The primary bile acids are synthesized in the liver and they could be hydrophobic or hydrophilic bile acids. And secondary bile acids um, are usually synthesized by um, bacterial deconjugation. Now, bile, uh, and bile acids are excreted into the intestine and what they do is to emulsify fats and fat soluble vitamins into micelles and this increases the availability for lipases to digest these fats, facilitating absorption through the intestinal cells or what we call the enterocytes. When there's impaired excretion of bile acids, as occurs in some of the um, PFIC subtypes, you have um, patients who are predisposed to malnutrition, to fat soluble vitamin deficiencies, and this is evidenced by things like rickets in the case of vitamin D deficiency, um, bleeding in the case of vitamin K deficiency, problems with nerve function in the case of vitamin E deficiency, as well as problems with um, night vision in the case of um, vitamin A deficiency. Now, when there's retention of bile acids in the hepatocytes or in the liver cells, um, this can lead to what we call pruritus or cholestatic pruritus. And actually the cause of cholestatic pruritus is still uncertain, but there are several hypotheses that have been proposed. And it's thought that um, pruritogens, or, which would include things like bile acids, activate neurons via a receptor called TGR, um, TGR5. Um, one of the other underlying premises of cholestasis is that accumulation of bile acids in cholestatic hepatocytes initiates um, hepatocyte cell death and inflammatory pathways that can promote liver injury and fibrosis. Fibrosis is when we see scarring in the liver and when there's um, the end result of that is the development of cirrhosis with um, portal hypertension when there's decompensated cirrhosis. Now, prior to talking about um, PFIC subtypes, I thought I'll just quickly run through on this one slide um, the function of a healthy liver. 
And so um, in hepatocytes, bile acids um, are taken up by this transporter called NTCP on the basal lateral um, membrane. Or alternatively, they can be synthesized from cholesterol by something known as CYP7A1 or cholesterol 7 alpha um, hydroxylase. The bile salt export protein, which I'll refer to as BSEP moving forward, um, on the canalicular membrane transports bile acids in an ATP dependent fashion into the bile. And BSEP expression is actually upregulated or regulated by um, FXR or Phanosoid X. Uh, receptor, which is a nuclear hormone receptor. Now, inclusion of phosphatidylcholine into bile is dependent on the multi-drug resistant 3 or MDR3 um, protein. So MDR3 uh, transports phosphatidylcholine uh, from the inner to the outer leaflet of the canalicular membrane, where it's available for incorporation into bile uh, micelles. And you have other um, canalicular proteins that uh, promote bowel formation such as um, MRL, MRP2 um, seen here. Now, when we talk about genetic causes for neonatal cholestasis, they account for um, neonatal cholestasis in probably about one in 18,000 infants. And generally, in, uh, as hepatologists, we like to think about this as high GGT or high gamma glutamyl transferase cholestasis or low or normal GGT cholestasis. And so for all intents and purposes, even though there are other genetic causes of a high GGT or low GGT cholestasis, I'm just going to limit myself to speaking on the uh, different subtypes of PFIC. And so when we think about genetic causes of high GGT cholestasis, um, that this would include, but is not limited to diseases such as alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, cystic fibrosis, and PFIC3 or MDR3 disease that's encoded for by the gene ABCB4. And when we talk about low GGT cholestasis, this can range from things like a bile acid synthesis um, deficiency, which we will not be talking about today, um, PFIC1 or FIC1 disease that's encoded for by the gene ATP8B1, PFIC2 or BCEP disease encoded for by the gene ABCB11, PFIC4 or the tight junction protein 2 disease encoded for by TJP2, PFIC5 or FXR disease encoded for by the gene NR1H4, PFIC6 or myosin 5B disease encoded for by the gene myosin 5B. In fact, it's thought there's even a PFIC7, um, which is also known as ABCC12 disease, but we're really not going to talk about that today. So generally, um, what are some of the symptoms that patients who have PFIC can present with? Uh, jaundice, a lot of these patients present in the neonatal period or in infancy. And jaundice could be one of the symptoms, even in, in those presenting in adulthood, jaundice can be seen. Um, there may be bleeding as a result of um, vitamin K deficiency. Uh, growth failure that's out of proportion with that seen in cholestasis. Um, itching is actually a very, very prominent symptom. And this can interfere with growth, with development, and lead to poor sleep patterns um, in these patients, in these children. And because some of the um, genes that are mutated or have loss of function in some of the different subtypes of PFIC are also expressed in other tissues, you can have extra hepatic manifestations such as diarrhea, hearing difficulties and recurrent pancreatitis. You may get a history, um, a family history of affected siblings, and you can also get a, a history in the mother of pregnancy-induced cholestasis. And so when we talk about the physical exam, we talked about growth failure, so it's important for us to look at the growth curves of these children, uh, scleral icterus. And as I had alluded to earlier, pruritus is a very prominent and troubling symptom in these patients. And so you may actually see lichenification of the skin of these patients when they do present with excoriation and bleeding. And I'll share some photos with you um, in this presentation. There's enlarged liver, spleen, hepatosplenomegaly, and of course, you can see rickets as we talked about earlier. When we look at the liver biochemistry, we can see evidence of hepatocellular injury as evidenced by elevation in the AST and ALT, which call the liver enzymes. Um, in clinical practice, 
the surrogate for cholestasis that can be quickly obtained is either conjugated bilirubin or direct bilirubin, depending on your um, institution and the lab. Um, the GGT could be would be normal or low for the subtypes 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6, and high for the subtype 3. Serum bile acids are high. Um, we would also send off urine um, for bile acids um, to be measured using mass spectrometry. And this is for us to, this is, enables us to exclude a bile acid synthesis defect. The liver biopsy is part of what we do in our evaluation. And we can see the presence of scarring or fibrosis in some patients, depending on the present timing of presentation, we can see cirrhosis. Um, we also send a piece of liver for electron microscopy, and I'll be sharing some histological slides um, on what we're looking for um, on the type of bile that's seen on electron microscopy. And we can actually do stains for some of these um, uh, transporter proteins by immunohistochemistry. So I'll share some of those slides with you from our pathologist. Um, genetic testing um, can be is available, and we would look for either candidate genes or you can do whole exome sequencing. So let's start talking about the different subtypes of PFIC. I'll start off with PFIC1. Now, thick one is important for distribution of lipids between the two leaflets of the apical membrane. And when thick one is not available to help maintain normal distribution of lipids between the two membranes of the lipid bilayer, the canalicular membrane may become vulnerable to damage by um, bile acids in the canaliculus. And so um, these patients would present, as we previously said, with itching, um, jaundice, fat soluble vitamin deficiency, short stature. And because um, ATP 8B1 is expressed in other tissue, you can see extra ma um, hepatic manifestations of recurrent pancreatitis, diarrhea, hearing loss, chronic cough. And the photo on the right just shows um, how troubling and bothersome pruritus is for these patients, as you can see, the scratch marks on these patients has resulted in expirations and actually bleeding um, in these patients. Now, we know that um, patients who have um, PFIC1 who had end-stage liver disease and undergone a liver transplant, they can have diarrhea post-transplant that's actually worse than diarrhea that occurred pre-transplant. And in fact, uh, some of these patients can have steatosis in the transplanted allograft. And I will share some histological slides on this from some patients of mine. Now, um, this slide shows us the electron microscopy um, in PFIC1. But this, the photo on the left is um, electron microscopy of a patient it's liver who does not have PFIC1. And the uh, photo on the right shows us uh, the electron microscopy of the liver of a patient who has PFIC1. And we can see the presence of these coarse granular um, bile, which is very characteristic um, in uh, PFIC1. And this is um, uh, a histological slide of a patient of mine who had PFIC1 and got a liver transplant. And we can see the red arrowheads are pointing to the presence of steatosis in the transplanted allograft. And these photos are courtesy of a pediatric liver pathologist here at Yale, Dr. Morodi. What about in PFIC2? Now, um, it normally, the bile salt export protein BCEP functions to transport bile out of the liver into the bowel and to the canaliculus. But where there are mutations in the gene ABCB11, you have various defects in BCEP that can cause truncation. And this impairs, and this actually would affect trafficking of bile outside of the liver into the canaliculus. And as such, you have retention of bile in the hepatocytes leading to um, injury that's seen. And so again, um, these patients would present with itching jaundice. We talk about fat soluble vitamin deficiency. Gallstones can be seen in about 30% of these patients. And these patients actually can rapidly progress to cirrhosis with um, development of portal hypertension and complications of portal hypertension. And they characteristically have a high risk of um, cancers, specifically hepatocellular carcinoma, cholangiocarcinoma. And this can actually appear as early as five years of age. And so this again is a patient of mine with um, PFIC2. 
And what the red um, arrowhead is trying to um, show is the presence of um, giant cell transformation of these hepatocytes. And I probably ought to have shown um, what a normal liver looks like for you to appreciate that there's so much lobular disarray. And so you're not seeing the nice hepatic acinus that we would normally see in a normal liver um, um, biopsy. When we stain um, for the BCEP protein by immunohistochemistry in these patients, the slide on the left shows us normal BCEP staining within the canaliculi of the liver. And this is a, the patient um, with PFIC2. You can see that we've got um, lost, partially lost BCEP expression, and even the BCEP expression looks very abnormal um, in this patient. Now, this is um, a published. Uh, these slides actually from a publication from my former center in Chicago um, of a patient who was transplanted for um, PFIC2. Now, we know that patients who get transplanted for PFIC2 can develop a clinical a phenotype um, post-transplant that's very similar to PFIC2 that's, that's seen in the native liver. And this is because these patients um, have uh, alloreactive antibodies that are specific to one extracellular loop of the BCEP protein. And this, these antibodies block the function of the normal BCEP protein in the transplanted um, allograft. And so if we start going from um, the slide deck A, uh, what the red arrowhead is showing us is the presence of micronodular cirrhosis. So this is the explant um, of um, the patients who had PFIC2. And the black arrowheads are showing the presence of um, giant cell transformation of the hepatocytes. Um, moving on to slide B, this again is the explant where we've stained for BCEP, and you can see the absence of um, BCEP staining in the liver of this patient. And the slide C is really um, a positive control that we use for um, looking for other canalicular proteins to show that our staining methodology was intact and fine. And that's what the red arrowhead shows. Now, um, the slide D is the transplanted allograft. Essentially, this patient developed the phenotype of um, uh, PFIC2 in the transplanted post-transplant um, because of these alloreactive antibodies against the normal BCEP protein. And so the transplanted allograft again shows us, you can see um, what the black arrowheads are trying to show is giant cell transformation of the hepatocytes akin to what we see um, in, um, the norm, in the native liver of a patient with um, um, PFIC2. And in fact, this patient had to be transplanted twice before we caught on to the diagnosis. And so this is another transplanted allograft. Again, the black arrowheads showing the giant cell transformation of the hepatocytes. Now, what about in PFIC3? In PFIC3, there's um, deficiency of uh, phosphatidylcholine um, in the bile. And so therefore, what this means is you have free bile acids that result in a detergent bile, and this is injurious to the cholangiocyte membranes. And this is, a, this is different from the normal um, patient without PFIC, a normal individual without PFIC, where you have phosphatidylcholine um, that um, incorporates with bile to make the bile um, less toxic. There's a wide spectrum of um, presentation for MDR3 uh, disease as shown on this slide. Um, and essentially, about 50% of these patients will respond to um, ERSO, the tertiary bile acid, ERSO deoxycholic acid. And essentially, you get a reduction in the detergent nature of the bile that can be um, achieved through supplementation with um, ERSO deoxycholic acid. Now, um, this is again the explant of a patient of mine with um, PFIC3. Now, this patient presented to us at the age of 15 from another country. By that time, she had developed, she was cirrhotic and had developed um, portal hypertension with decompensation um, and had a GI bleed. And what the red arrowhead is just showing us is the presence of um, biliary um, cirrhosis. So this is the explant of the patient. Now, what about, um, let's move on to PFIC4 or the tight junction protein disease. And uh, the tight junction proteins and claudine actually maintain 
the um, canalicular structure as well as the integrity and they protect against the toxic properties of um, secreted bile acids and so the disease cause is very similar to what we see in PFIC1. You can also have a multi-system involvement. So these patients may have respiratory problems or duodenitis. Um, we would manage them also with um, biliary diversion, be it external, internal, ileal exclusion. And for those who have a uh, decompensated liver disease, obviously um, liver transplantation would be um, uh, recommended. Now, PFIC5 or FXR disease, this is very rare. And this is a presentation, uh, this is a publication, I mean to say, of um, four patients from two unrelated families. So FXR or Phanosoid um, X receptor is encoded for by the gene NR1H4. And as I said, it's a nuclear receptor and a transcription factor and bile acids are its natural ligand. And it plays an important role in bile acid homeostasis. And so if hepatic bile acids are high, what FXR does is it represses bile acid synthesis and uptake and increases export of bile acids out of the liver um, in the intestinal cells because FXR is also um, expressed in the intestine. In response to bile acids being presented to the intestine, it induces expression of um, a growth factor known as fibroblast um, growth factor 19. And this gets in the portal circulation and travels to the liver and that and represses bile acid synthesis. Um, FXR can be involved also in regulation of other known cholestasis genes such as um, ABCB11 and perhaps less frequently ABCB4. And uh, in the publication of these four patients, these patients typically tend to present really early on right off the bat with um, se severe coagulopathy, liver failure. And the coagulopathy is vitamin K independent. And it's thought that it's thought to be a result of the fact that um, FXR is also involved in regulation of coagulation um, uh, as well. Now, uh, myosin 5B disease. Um, myosin 5B disease, uh, it, the um, absence of uh, myosin 5B was initially described in patients who have um, microvillous in inclusion disease that presents with congenital diarrhea. But we also have patients who've had um, some mutations in myosin 5 disease that present with cholestasis. I have a patient with um, one of my PFIC patients um, has this disease. I probably ought to have included her histology slides as well. But essentially, pruritus is a very, again, a prominent symptom. So she presented with pruritus and low GGT cholestasis. And the biopsy just really showed um, bland canalicular cholestasis with some bile duct um, injury. Diarrhea was not um, one of her symptoms as we see in these patients. Now I'm going to move on to talking about therapies and talk about what's established therapies. So um, I mentioned growth failure as one of the symptoms in these patients and so nutritional support is exceedingly important for these patients. Pruritus can be very disabling and um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the medical treatment for pruritus that's um, out there. Uh, surgical um, management, non-transplant surgery management would be the biliary diversion, and this could be partial external, uh, this could be internal biliary diversion or ileal exclusion. And for those who have um, end-stage liver disease, um, liver transplantation is um, an option. Now, um, what this table shows us is the medical management for pruritus that's out there for children. And so we're gonna just start off with talking about cholestyramine. This is an ion exchange resin. It acts as a bile acid binder in the intestine, decreases um, uh, ileal bile acid um, absorption and increases bile acid excretion in the feces. Um, now trexone is an opioid antagonist. It's thought that it uh, blocks the permissive activity on pruritus neuronal signaling. Uh, rifampin is a cytochrome um, P453A4 inducer. Um, it is thought it increases, that it increases the metabolism and renal excretion of pruritogenic substances and perhaps is an antibacterial effect that can modify intestinal metabolism of pruritogenic substances. Um, the SSRI um, cetrolin, this is um, an agent that I have not used in any of my patients. 
Um, but its proposed mechanism is thought to include increase in central serotonergic tone that regulates pruritus. Orsodeoxycholic um, acid is something that is very commonly used as a tertiary bile acid. It's thought to um, increase bile acid secretion. It's thought to essentially dilute the bile acid pool. Um, so you have less of the toxic bile acids, reduces ileal absorption of um, hydrophilic um, bile acids. Now, there are a lot of novel therapies um, that have been proposed that are out there in the horizon. And these novel therapies can either focus on the um, transporter protein expression or function, or focus on the bile acid um, pathway. And I'm just going to show a very busy slide, and uh, pardon me for this busy slide, but what, I, what I'm trying to show here is essentially that there are all these novel therapies that have been proposed to improve cholestasis um, in patients with cholestatic liver diseases, and they're all um, um, shown in pink. And I'm just going to go um, through this real quickly. So in hepatocytes, you can have um, down regulation of um, this inhibitor, um, NTCP, uh, down regulation of, of NTCP with an inhibitor. And this is thought that it reduces the bile acid burden on the hepatocytes and hence the subsequent toxicity to the um, hepatocytes. Alternatively, you can have um, uh, stimulating, you can stimulate canalicular and hepatocyte um, bile acid efflux pumps, either with FXR agonists, with urso deoxycholic acid, or molecular chaperones. And again, this serve to reduce um, bile acid burden on the hepatocyte, improve bile flow, and improve um, fat um, absorption. Um, you can stimulate uh, the canalicular um, MDR3 using the PIPA alpha agonist. And essentially what this does is increases phosphatidylcholine secretion um, into the bile. And this protects um, bile acid toxin, this protects against bile acid toxicity to the um, cholangiocytes. Um, you can also um, you can also use strategies that inhibit bile acid synthesis um, by inhibiting um, this cholesterol 7 alpha hydroxylase or CYP7A, either with um, FXR agonists or um, with uh, and this again just reduces um, bile acid toxicity to the hepatocytes. Now, when you move on to the ileal um, cells, and this is where um, I like to focus a lot more time on, um, in the ileal enterocytes, what you could do is you can inhibit bile acid uptake um, from the um, ileal enterocytes by inhibiting this apical sodium bile acid transporter. Um, and essentially what this does is it will increase uh, fecal excretion of um, bile acids. It would lower the bile acid pool, change bile acid composition, as well as alter um, FXR signaling. And so um, the treatment trials of the use of this apical sodium bile acid transports, transporter inhibitor um, that are currently ongoing by um, two pharmaceutical companies, one of which is sponsoring this webinar, and um, I'm just going to go through very briefly um, what we know so far. So first of all, I'll start off with um, a preclinical model that set things off, and this is this is published by um, Alex Meiske and his laboratory at Cincinnati. And essentially, when they looked in the mouse model of um, PFIC, and they used this um, apical sodium bile acid uh, transport inhibitor. What they found was that this agent suppressed liver inflammation, it reduced bile duct injury, and it was able to slow down progression of fibrosis. And so this subsequently led to um, a phase two open label safety and efficacy study of this agent in children who have PFIC2, children of PFIC, um, and is sponsored by one of the pharmaceutical companies. They, they presented um, preliminary findings at the European Association of Study of Liver Disease, or EASL, um, in 2019. And um, just to summarize their findings, they thought there was, they found a treatment benefit in a subset of children who have PFIC2. And this treatment benefit was evidenced by the improvement in growth, 
normalization or substantial reduction in serum bile acids, disappearance or substantial reduction in pruritus, normalization of bilirubin and liver enzyme levels, improvement in, liver pro in the lipid profile, as well as improvement in the health-related quality of life. And they thought that this growth improvement may be related to reduction in pruritus, better sleep, or better fat um, absorption. And a phase three study will be conducted to further investigate this agent in uh, children with PFIC. Now, the second um, uh, pharmaceutical company, which is sponsoring this webinar, um, shared some slides with me yesterday, and I'd like to just go through this with you. Um, essentially, what they did was, they looked to see what was the percentage of patients 15 years on after biliary diversion had been done, 15 years on after a diagnosis of PFIC, how many patients were surviving or what percentage of patients were surviving with their native liver 15 years on. So this is a typo, this should say no surgical diversion. Essentially what they found was that those patients who had had um, surgical diversion surgery, uh, surgical diversion performed, had a significantly higher likelihood of surviving with their native liver 15 years on following diversion, diagnosis diversion, surgical diversion, compared to those patients who did not have surgical diversion. And so then focusing on those patients who um, had surgical diversion, they tried to look to see what level of serum bile acids could tease out those who did well from those who did not do well. And essentially what they found was that um, those patients who had surgical diversion and had, um, following the diversion, had a serum bile acid that was less than 118 micromoles per liter, they had a higher likelihood, as you can see here, of a 95% of surviving with their native liver 15 years on following surgical diversion compared to those who after diversion, the serum bile acids was 118 or greater micromoles per liter. In fact, you did not even have to normalize the serum bile acids. All you had to have was perhaps a greater than 70% decrease in serum bile acids after surgical diversion to improve your likelihood of surviving with your native liver compared to those who had 70% or less decrease in serum bile acids um, following um, biliary diversion. And so this was what led to um, the uh, phase, put this being transferred into the clinical um, field. And this, they um, talk, they have, th this slide shows results of their phase two trial um, in pediatric patients who have PFIC, biliary atresia, allergic syndrome. And essentially um, what they were able to report was that um, in those patients in whom they, they saw quite a significant drop in the serum bile acids that's shown here. This is the pharmaceutical name um, for the drug. Um, they found a significant drop in serum bile acids. And when you look at the drop in serum bile acids, this correlated very nicely with improvements in um, itching. Um, which using each of these um, four different skills in, in these patients. Importantly, as with any drug trial, you want to be sure that you don't have significant adverse, adverse, adverse effects. They found a favorable tolerability profile um, in the study. Um, and uh, at this moment, there's actually a phase three um, trial that's a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled study that's um, out there to demonstrate the efficacy and safety of this um, apical sodium bile um, acid transporter inhibitor in children who have a diagnosis of PFIC1 uh, or PFIC2. And um, at this point, I'd like to turn over and hand over to uh, Nicole Radigan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ekong. Nicole, if you can go ahead. Hello. I think we can all hear you. Okay. Uh, you can go ahead and get started. 
everyone. I apologize. I think that we lost Nicole um, due to technical difficulties. Uh, we can give it just one minute to see if she's able to log back on. I hope so because I, I she has a really great story about her daughter Jamie. So um, we will wait just one second. Okay, unfortunately, we are unable to get Nicole back. Um, so we will go ahead and move on to questions, Dr. E. Kong, if that's okay. Sure, that's fine with me. Okay, great. Um, so the first question is, can BRIC2 turn into PFIC2 later in life? So by and large, it's thought that, um, as the name suggests, benign recurrent intrahepatic cholestasis syndrome is benign. Um, and these patients typically would just present with um, with intermittent periods of cholestasis that uh, self-resolve. Now, uh, having said that, in one of my former institutions, we've had one of our patients whose diagnosis was truly benign recurrent intrahepatic cholestasis, but he had such disabling um, pruritus and disabling symptoms that he needed to have a liver transplant. So really, truly, um, BRIC should not progress to become PFIC. Um, and generally, we like to think about it as um, a benign disease, but you, you essentially don't progress to progressive liver disease as you would with you know, the PFICs. Thank you. Do PBC and PFIC2 present similarly on a biopsy, or are there clear differences? There are differences. Uh, PBC is generally more of um, a cholangiopathy and is a disease that's seen mostly in adults. Um, again, having said that, there are case reports of um, presentation in patients who are as young as 16, 17 years of age. The uh, findings on liver biopsy, are, uh, the, the, the findings are very different. Um, PBC is what we call an autoimmune disease, whereas um, uh, PFIC2 is a genetic disease. Um, in PFIC2, what we find, um, as I showed you in the histological slide, is we see, you don't see like, you know, the nice liver acinosis, there's so much like confusion going on there in the liver, what we call lobular disarray, and you see all these um, uh, giant cell transformation of um, hepatocytes. Um, you see cholestasis in um, PBC. This is a cholangiopathy. So a lot of the findings you're seeing are in the bile ducts themselves. And you also have um, presence of um, antibodies to antimitochondrial, um, you know, you have presence uh, of antimitochondrial antibodies. So it's a totally pruritus is the only symptom that's similar between the two, but pruritus can be seen in anyone with a cholestatic liver disease. Thank you. Uh, what is the likelihood of PFIC type 2 reoccurrence after liver transplant? Um, as I showed in, the, um, in, in my presentation, we have seen this happen um, because these patients essentially are taking someone who um, has, whose immune system has not seen um, BCEP. BCEP is present in all livers. And so you give them a normal liver now that has BCEP. And so they then form, the immune system forms antibodies um, against uh, this um, protein that blocks the function of this protein. And so these patients um, really show phenotype of PFIC2, but it can be successfully treated. And so even if it did, this is something we have to think about for those of us who look after children or children with liver transplants as a cause of graft dysfunction. Um, for certainly someone who was transplanted because of um, BCEP disease, you would have to consider this as a possibility. But it's very, it, it, it's very, it, it's very well. Once it's recognized, it can be treated successfully. Thank you. Um, can you discuss the risk for HCC and PFIC in general, but specifically type 2 and 4? So, um, eight, so malignancy is seen, has been frequently reported in patients who have um, 
PCEP disease or PFIC2. And in fact, it occurs even as early as five, six years of age. And so this is something that um, one needs to be obviously um, alert to the possibility of this and recognize and look for um, for this, because this is something that has been seen. In fact, um, in my former sense, we've had a six-year-old who unfortunately developed HCC and and, um, and and died from HCC. And so this is um, a truly, this can be a devastating uh, complication that can be seen. Uh, what is the inheritance pattern of PSEC? I'm sorry, what is the? Inheritance pattern. Oh, it's what we call autosomal, re uh, autosomal recessive inheritance. So, for if two if uh, 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 two parents are carriers of the gene, for every pregnancy, there's a one in four chance that that child may have um, PFIC, depending on whatever gene they've got. So, it's an autosomal recessive inheritance. Thank you. Um, what are the complications for p 3 post-liver transplant? So um, post-liver transplant, we've not really had um, a, a, a lot of complications in patients who have um, PFIC3 that's specific to PFIC3, as opposed to just regular complications that would result from a liver transplant. Uh, the one thing that we do know is because the parents would be heterozygous, they um, will not be good um, living donor candidates just because of the risk for stone. We can have really bad intrahepatic um, cholelithiasis. And so um, the, the parents typically would not be good living donor candidates. But in terms of complications post-transplant that is related to the disease itself, um, it's not something that we've seen. Thank you. Is it ever possible to have disease symptoms when you only have one mutated copy of p 2 um, I think it is possible. And in fact, sometimes those are some of the patients that maybe would be called, um, would present like BRIC2. Um, so because when we, we talk about like BRIC1 and BRIC2, and it's essentially some mutations seen um, heterozygotes in um, thick one as well as in biceps. So yes. Thank you. Can ASBT inhibitor be used to treat biliary atresia? Uh, there's, a, there's a trial that's ongoing now um, by um, one of the um, pharmaceutical companies to see if it, it's not used to treat biliary atresia, but to treat pruritus in biliary atresia. Um, and so that, that, that's, that trial is ongoing at this moment. So I can't answer that question because I do not know the results of that yet. What is the life expectancy of children with PFIC type 1? Um, children who have PFIC type 1, essentially, as in with a lot of liver diseases now, with early diagnosis management, the life expectancy is long. And so um, um, right now, you know, you, a lot of these patients present really early on within the first few months of life. Um, if they're not cirrhotic, they'll get a biliary diversion done. Um, and um, if they develop um, decompensated liver disease, they're listed for liver transplantation. And essentially, um, the life expectancy with the normal ones, as long as the liver transplants, um, there aren't any issues with the transplanted graft. You know, the life expectancy um, certainly we talk about liver half-life. We just published on 25 years on following a pediatric liver transplantation. And so really, it truly is what you would expect for um, any other person who has um, liver transplantation. Um, we recognize, of course, that um, they are, because liver transplantation is not curative for PFIC1, um, you can have you know, diarrhea as a troublesome symptom, but this again can be managed um, medically. And you can have occurrence of steatosis in the transplanted allograft. And we don't, we have various speculation as to why steatosis occurs um, in the transplanted allograft, but we, we don't know exactly why, but there are all these hypotheses that we've put out, but um, we think we know how we can manage this. Um, right now, I think at the time of transplant, the thought process is perhaps we need to also um, think about doing some form of a diversion 
procedure that, at that point in time to prevent the occurrence of steatosis post-transplant. Thank you. What are the chances of losing hearing with PFIC2? Um, I don't have percentages, um, but it's something that has been reported. Um, it's, it's something because uh, um, ABCB11B can be expressed in, uh, here in, in the ear tissues. And so I, I do not actually have a percentage to tell you uh, the frequency of hearing loss in PFIC2, but it certainly is something that um, uh, can occur. Thank you. Um, what is the life expectancy of PFIC2? The life expectancy without any without any treatment, so in, without any surgical diversion, without transplants, is going to be low. But luckily, we make this diagnosis early on, within a lot of times within the first year of life, manage this with um, biliary diversion. And for those patients who progress to end-stage liver disease, biliary diversion essentially we, um, uh, in, increases, uh, how do I put this? What, what biliary diversion does is it uh, increases the uh, time before one develops the compensated liver disease. And once one develops the compensated liver disease, we will undergo liver transplantation. And so um, that would be the way we would manage this. And as such, uh, you don't have impact, you would not have a worse life expectancy compared to some other individual who has a, liver, a functioning liver transplant. If, um, whereas if you had you know, no treatment whatsoever, obviously you have a terrible life expectancy because it rapidly progresses to cirrhosis in the absence of treatment. But that is not the standard of care. Thank you. Is it possible to be an adult with PFIC2 and be asymptomatic? Um, there have been patients who, because there are various different mutations, so there have been patients who um, present in um, adulthood. Um, and so increasingly, some of our adult colleagues uh, get in to try and understand uh, genetic liver diseases that are typically seen more in pediatric liver, in pediatric hepatology than adult hepatology. Um, but one thing that we caution is presenting in adulthood does not preclude a progressive liver disease. One can still have progression in liver disease even when they present in adulthood, um, even when they present in adulthood. Thank you. What teeth management do we need to consider with PFIC type 1 patients? So what causes tooth decay, discoloration, et cetera? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed that. What, what? What can teeth you... management do we need to consider with PFIC type 1 patients? What causes what tooth decay and discoloration? Well, that's really uh, uh, bilirubin. And so again, early diagnosis, you don't have like um, a lot of, uh, we see, we see um, uh, teeth, a lot of teeth discoloration in patients who have um, cholestatic liver disease. So even a patient who has, um, say, biliary atresia with marked elevated um, serum bilirubin levels, you would see discoloration of teeth. And essentially what we always recommend is good dental um, hygiene. Um, we like to bring, we like to get people um, keyed into um, dental care pretty early on. But um, this is something that we, we see also in um, patients with cholestatic liver disease, not necessarily just um, PFIC. Okay, does ABT transporter, uh, is it helpful for PFIC in reducing the hepatocyte damage? Um, that, is the, um, that is what we saw in the preclinical models, and that's what we're studying in the clinical trials that are ongoing at this point in time. But the preclinical models, so this is a mouse model of PFIC that showed that it actually did indeed reduce fibrosis progression. But that's something that we're studying right now with the trials that are ongoing. Thank you. Is fertility affected in PFIC1 patients? Um, that is some, that is something that I would have to look into, see what's actually published on fertility in patients who have PFIC1. 
Uh, I'm not um, familiar with published data on that, and I don't know if anyone's really looked um, in um, in a proper fashion at that, because I, I, I don't know that we have a registry that actually does collect fertility data, because that's what you would want um, to be able to um, know how fertility is affected um, in these patients. Great, thank you. So that's all we have for uh, questions I, right now, but we do have Nicole back um, on the line, and I would love for her to be able to uh, go ahead and share her story. Um, I do want to say for any additional questions, we will get those answered. Nicole? Nope, I guess it's still it's not working. Sorry about that. Uh, we tried. <laughs> so there was one more question that did pop up. Um, yeah. What would when would it be appropriate time for a transplant for kids with CFIC2 with sort of manageable itching? Well, so I think if, uh, as in folks who have chronic liver disease, we typically tend to say, I mean, because what I say to my patients is because I also wear the hat of a transplant hepatologist, it does not mean that everybody I see, I want to give a liver transplant to. Um, by and large, we're very good at liver transplants now, but one year um, patient survival is not necessarily 100%. And so it's in high 90s, but not 100%. And so if you've got your native liver without any decompensation, with it um, functioning normally, um, without disabling pruritus that's um, impairing quality of life, then um, truly you're much better off with your native liver. Um, typically, when we tend to consider moving, tripping the transplant switch, when we either have a development of decompensated liver disease, and so what are the, the symptoms of a decompensated liver? I, I should say, first of all, folks can be cirrhotic, but still have compensated liver function. And if, you're, if one is cirrhotic with compensated liver function, that's still not an indication for transplantation. However, if one has decompensation, so they could develop things like um, a gastrointestinal bleed because they've got um, esophageal or gastric viruses, or they could develop um, ascites, fluid in the belly, again, because of decompensated liver disease, um, there could be growth, severe, significant growth failure despite um, you know, maximizing nutritional inputs. And there are patients who can actually have really disabling um, pruritus that totally just impairs their growth and development. If any of those, that's not amenable to any of the other treatment strategies. Uh, and if any of that happened, that definitely would mean that that patient, would, that would trip the switch for us to think about transplantation um, in, in those patients. And obviously, for patients who have PFIC2, you're thinking of their risk for malignancy, and so you obviously have to be monitoring these patients for that, for the presence of that, um, and because that obviously would, even if they were not quote unquote decompensated, if they had, um, if you noticed a growth in the liver that was suggestive of um, HCC, that also has to change the um, approach that you're going to use. Thank you. Would liver transplant be considered with poor growth and quality of life alone in patients with PFIC2? Yes, it would. Okay. Is itchy ear a common symptom in PFIC type 2 patients after transplant? Uh, pruritus is not um, a symptom after transplantation because now you have a liver with normal BCEP, so you have bile acid transports without any issue. Pruritus would not be an issue. Pruritus becomes an issue if that individual develops um, the phenotype, as we talked about in post-transplants of PFIC2. And so then they become cholestatic and hence may have pruritus. Can hearing loss develop with older kids with PFIC2? Uh, yes, that's a possibility. And on that same topic, um, can PFIC type 1 patients develop hearing problems? Um, PFIC type 1, because it's also expressed in different tissues, you can have that, yes. Okay. 
What causes some people with PSYC2 mutation to get BRIC2 versus PSYC2? Well, it depends on the mutation they have. Some people have abs abs total absence of, um, of um, ABCB11 uh, and so obviously would have the progressive disease. And so it depends on what type of mutation they have, loss of function, um, biallelic mutation, all sorts of different mutations. So it depends on what mutation they have. And then when would it be appropriate, an appropriate time for transplant for kids with PSYC2 that have sort of manageable itching? Well, I just answered that question, right? If you have decompensated liver disease, that would be an indication for us to think transplantation. If we saw a patient who had a growth in the liver and we were worried about malignancy, those things would trip the switch for us to consider transplantation. Okay, thank you. That's um, all the questions we have. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Ekong, for taking the time to do this webinar and answer all of these um, great questions we had. Um, thank you to Alberio Pharmaceuticals for supporting this webinar, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, with that being said, we'll bring this webinar to a close, um, and we'll answer any additional questions you may have at a later date. This will be recorded as well and available on our website. Thank you so much for participating today. Thank you.